Where are you giving an insta yes? Where are you automatically complying with things in life and in the world? We all were raised, be a good girl. Turn that frown around. If you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Like I could keep going, I won't. But you know that we were indoctrinated into a culture of you should make sure that everyone else is comfortable and that you are not making them uncomfortable. Don't be rude, be polite, send a thank you note, all the things that we learned that can make adult life creating boundaries very difficult. For sure. Well, hello there, and welcome back to The Terry Cole Show. I'm your host, Terry Cole, and we are continuing our special series um, where the tables are turned, and I'm the one who's actually being interviewed in this series. So I'm on the other side of the microphone, offering a glimpse into my personal stories, challenges, and the intimate details of my work, and really, because I'm usually the interviewer, I don't actually get a chance to do this often, so it's kind of fun. This week, I'm excited to feature an episode from my time with the incredible Danny Morell on his empowering podcast. So Danny is an inspirational figure really in his own right and has a way of diving deep into conversations that matter. And I was so thrilled to actually sit down with him in person in Austin, Texas, to discuss a topic that is so close to my heart, as you all know, the power of setting healthy boundaries. In our conversation, Danny posed some really compelling questions that set the stage for a deep dive into the importance of boundary setting for living an authentic life. So throughout the episode, I shared my insights on how to establish and communicate boundaries respectfully, and we tackled the common issues of putting yourself last, like what happens when you're putting yourself last, and how that often leads to resentment, along with strategies for reclaiming your power by understanding your preferences, limits, desires, and deal breakers. So whether you're new to the concept of boundaries, or you're looking to strengthen your boundary setting skills, this conversation with Danny Morell I really think is filled with valuable gems, lessons, and some actionable advice that you can use right away. So without further ado, let's dive into this transformative episode. I hope that you find empowerment and inspiration to start setting more healthy boundaries in your own life. Here's my conversation with Danny Morell. I hope that you enjoy it. Welcome to the Higher Self Podcast. The purpose of this podcast is to help you unravel anything keeping you from a life of true abundance, joy, and happiness, which is your birthright. Each week, we'll bring in different guests specifically tailored to help you on your journey to discovering your higher self, whether it's spirituality, business, finances, health, or relationships, there are no topics that are off limits. So get ready and enjoy this week's episode of The Higher Self. Welcome to this week's episode of The Higher Self. Ladies, this one is for you. We have a special guest that is going to teach you how to stop. What is it? Overdoing? Over. Overgiving. Overgiving. Over everything. Overfeeling. Overfeeling. How about just have healthy boundaries? How about that? Welcome, Terry Cole. How are you? <laughs> well, thanks for having me, Danny. I'm so, great. So I think you're the first psychotherapist that we've ever had on the show. Really? Yeah. Yeah. So what is a psychotherapist? I'm really just a mental health professional who's licensed. Okay. And, and what got you into that field? You know, I actually was a talent agent for supermodels and celebrities for a bunch of years prior to, but my own therapeutic journey was happening simultaneously. It was like this parallel process. And I just couldn't believe how amazing my internal and external life became from becoming psychologically well, understanding why was I doing the things I was doing or what, why was I in a certain amount of pain? And then I couldn't believe that everyone in the world <laughs> wasn't in therapy. I was like, wait, do you know about this? Do you understand? Yeah. So even though I was climbing the ladder in entertainment and I had, you know, worked really hard, really fast, I was, you know, running a bicoastal talent agency in New York representing, I mean, from Naomi Campbell to anyone else, mm -hmm. but I got to a point where all I cared about was the mental health of my clients. Like I literally was like Pantene deal, don't care, you know? And I was like, you need to get out of here and do something that you actually care about. But it was a little bit challenging because I was, I had worked hard to get kind of to the top of this mountain. And I thought that all the money and all the famous people and all the stuff, like I was chasing a feeling that I really did think resided up there. And then I got there and I was like, oh crap. Yeah. The feeling is now there. Yeah. So I went back to school, went to NYU, got my master's, became a psychotherapist. And then I was like, oh, yeah, this is my yeah. jam. 
Yeah. You know, it, it reminds me not only of my life, because it's exactly what happened to me, but mm-hmm. I'm reading this wonderful book called The Second Mountain. Mm-hmm. Have you ever heard of it? Mm-mm. Jeez, and I hope that's the title of the book. But it's The Second Mountain, and it talks about how we as human beings, it's like the first mountain that we climb is this mountain that is all about self, <laughs> right? It's all about self-gratification, whether we want to admit it or not. It's all about what we're going to get out of life right. and what we're going to get out of other people. And then we get to the top of that mountain and we realize like, this isn't as fun as I thought it was going to be, <laughs> right? right? And mm-hmm. then we go up our second mountain and that's when we want to help change the lives of other people. Yes. And it sounds like that's what happened to you. Yes. You know, Wayne Dyer used to talk about sort of the the morning of your life is about acquisition and the afternoon of your life is about meaning, like creating meaning in the world and internally and externally. And I was really vibed with that like, yeah. And hey, nothing wrong with acquisition, right? No. Nothing wrong with wanting and creating an opulent life for yourself. But what are you doing for others? And yeah, I believe I'm I'm climbing the second mountain right now. That's right. What what drove you to start working with a therapist? Because I, I I know at least in my journey and in many of the people that I've interviewed, there's always this something happens. Mm-hmm. What was it for you? Well, I was young when I got into therapy. So I was about 19, and I stopped drinking when I was about 21 from being in therapy. So what drove me to therapy really was just something very simple. I was in college, and the school was closed because we had tons and tons of snow for like, we didn't have school for like two weeks. And having all that time on my hands, because I was such a doer, I started feeling depressed. And I had never had that experience before in my life. And I was like, wow, this is weird. And so I sought out therapy, and that was the very beginning of having this light switch go off, that I could see things differently. It was almost like that first therapeutic experience. I used to think, like, here's life. Here are the hands that you're dealt. Make the best of that hand. And therapy, I was like, no. Like, you could get a hand, and I could be like, I don't like this hand. I don't, I don't like this game. I'm creating a new deck. I'm creating a new game for myself. So that's what drove me to it. And then quitting drinking, really, was a game changer in being like, and wide awake all the time in yeah. life. That was a huge life-changing thing. And I was only 21 at the time. And I have to say, I've, I've been in therapy pretty much since then. Pretty much. I mean, a couple of years on and off, but mostly on. Two things really resonated with me, which you just said, which number one, you know, I, I, I talk about it and I, I talk about it in terms of masculine and feminine energy, mm-hmm. just because that's what I've noticed in my own journey, my own journey and my relationship with Jen. It's it's, it, I become very aware that there's two different parts of us and none is right or wrong. It's just that sometimes we get to be a little bit in balance, you know, and I know you help a lot of women. Mm-hmm. And what I notice in the women that I coach and I work with is, you know, they're, they're successful, they're powerful, they're motivated, they're driven, and, and they want to go out and accomplish or like scale that first mountain. Mm-hmm. And then something happens in life, right? Uh, and maybe it's a spiritual experience mm-hmm. or maybe it's an experience like being snowed in and not being able to do the thing that you're so wired to do. Mm-hmm. And it makes you go, wait a minute, like, why do I even want to do what I want to do? And it makes you really awaken and realize that you're actually very uncomfortable in not doing anything. Mm-hmm. And that's a sign. That's a sign that some things need to change. Is that how you felt? Yeah. And and it's funny, my therapist would give me um, homework. This is years later therapist, because I was always a very busy, very social person doing all the things as I was climbing the Hollywood ladder. And she was like, your homework is to stay home. Your homework is to be alone. Don't watch TV. Can't like absorb yourself in music. Like be still. And I was, this is before I had a dedicated meditation practice. And I was like, I mean, you know, four weeks in a row, I'd come in and she'd be like, so how was your evening with stillness? And I'd be like, I failed again. Like, I could not do it. That's right. And learning to finally meditate in my, later in my 20s, um, that really hit something for me. That created a massive internal shift because that stillness and silence, and I learned from Deepak Chopra and David G and David Simon, actually, because I went to the Chopra Center, that was something that was a huge shift and has become a big part of my therapeutic practice and all the courses and masterminds and the things that I do. I mean, I became a meditation teacher because I knew I was the worst person in the world 
who, you know, the most type A, the least sit still, the the most like there's got to be a hack for meditation, you know? And then the reality, of course, uh, there is not. No. Uh, no. You just have to sit on your sit ass down. and meditate. Shut up. <laughs> exactly. Just <laughs> yeah. stop effing talking. Yeah. And I figured if I could do that and experience that internal expansion that was created from that, that it would really benefit my therapy clients to be able to do it. So I just started spontaneously doing that and they would, you know, film, they would record it on their phones. And it really started this movement where even the least likely people realize, I always say like, if you have an ass and a couch, you're a meditator. Like you don't need any special skills and you don't have to be in Nepal. It's like, you can be wherever you are now. It's just about creating a little bit more internal stillness and silence. And isn't that, it's so beautiful, the paradigm of what you said, because it's the opposite of what society and the system tells us. It's like the society and the system tells us that we need everything outside of us to feel good, happy, complete. We need success. We need power. We need achievement. We need attainment. We need glamour. We need a, a man. You know, we need a woman, a, a partner. You know, we need a drink. We need a smoke. We need the red bottom shoes. We need, we need, we need, right? And in reality, you know, and I could say this from my own experience is that I was that guy. I was that guy that could not sit still. I was that guy that went for a bottle of tequila. I was that guy that went to go be with a woman. I was the guy that went to turn on the TV until I finally decided, wait a minute, why can't I just be with myself? And that's when my mind was mm -hmm. blown, right? We even need family. You know, like nothing wrong with family, but I remember one Christmas I was sitting there, I was going through a divorce and it was just me. No kids, no present, no trees, no everything. We need Christmas. We need holidays, right? Everything outside of us. Right. And when I finally was able to sit there, it's like this little tear came down my, my eye here. And, I, and I'm pointing here because it was my feminine side, right? And it was like, that was the beginning mm -hmm. of me finding my heart. You know, that was the beginning of my mind mm -hmm. and my constant need for something outside of me to fulfill me and say, you know what? Even in, the, in this thing that as a little boy, I craved so much, this experience called Christmas, yeah. that even in this, mm -hmm. wow, I don't really need it anymore. Right. But look at the construct. It's like what you're saying is, you know, we, we buy into these constructs and the holidays is a really big one for a lot of people and can be really painful for a lot of people. Yeah. But in your experience, like you survived the holiday without the tree and the presents and the things. And you know what happens? The sun comes up tomorrow, right? The moon is still going to come out. Like you're still going to be okay. You're still going to have coffee tomorrow. Like it's all going to be okay. But it's this, what you're saying, I, I really vibe with on the feeling like we need the external things to bolster us but also the external validation. And I think that part of becoming still and silent, and especially for women, because we are raised differently, right? Most women are raised and praised for being self-abandoning codependents. Like, that makes you a good woman. If you would give the shirt off your back to anybody, people are like, she's amazing, you'd love her. She would give anyone the shirt off her back. I wanna be like, Betty, keep your effing shirt on. Like. Why are we have no discernment or why would we give anybody the shirt off our back and why would that be celebrated? So I think that part of learning about boundaries and being more authentic is understanding what your own preferences, limits, desires, and deal breakers are, and then having the ability to communicate them. But from birth, if you were raised as a woman, you're taught to not prioritize how you feel, what you think, and what you want. Terry, it's like this energy of martyrdom, isn't it? Yes. It's like a woman is raised to put herself second. Or last. Or last. Not even second, Not even dude. second. Like second is like really good. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Where do you think that comes from and why do you think that is? Well, I think it's home training for most people and society. It's society believes this. So, so part of my work is having people reimagine what it means to be honest, to be authentic, to tell the truth. I look at you, my boundaries, your boundaries, as like my own personal rules of engagement because it lets other people know what's okay with me and what's not okay with me. Mm -hmm. And we set people up to succeed when they're clear about our boundaries, right? 
there's so many, especially in relationships, right? There's so many things that your partner can do or cannot do. And why, why are we making people guess? Why don't we just tell the truth about, oh, I, I prefer to this. I prefer you call me. I don't love to text. It's not my thing. Mm -hmm. So instead of every time your new person texts you, like, oh, I don't think they're, they're not that into me because they're texting. And if they really cared about me, they'd call. They don't know that that's what it means to you. So we let people know our preferences because how they respond to that tells us what they're willing, able, capable of doing. Can they remember? Do they care? Do they go, well, you'd rather call, but I hate phones, so I'm never calling you? Well, okay. But now you have data, a data point That's right. about how important you are to this person, about what they're willing to do around your preferences. But I think that when you're raised to think that your preference is a burden, your preference makes you bossy. Your preference makes you controlling, hysterical. You must be on your period. Like There's so much crap that as women we deal with, especially women in leadership, you know, and the double standard, of course, we know is alive and well, but there's ways of us deciding that we're not, we're not going to subscribe to that double standard. I'm happy to assert my preferences to you or anybody. And if you think I'm too controlling, that's okay. Yeah. That's your side of the street. Yeah. So if I'm a woman and I'm listening to you right now and I'm going, oh my God, like this is resonating so much with me because I do put myself last and I, mm -hmm. and I, I don't have boundaries and I don't uphold them. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm even scared of this conversation because this is bringing up parts of me that like, this is a mirror for, for what's missing in my life right now, mm -hmm. right? How does a woman start that journey? How does a woman begin that journey to saying, you know, maybe, I, I know for us, like in, in our culture, in the Hispanic culture, mm -hmm. pff, I hate it. I hate it because it's like the woman is literally like, if you go into like the depths of like Mexico or some of these Latin American countries, mm -hmm. it's like the man is able to literally get away with murder. Yeah. The man is able to go out there and be with multiple different women, yeah. multiple different families, father 20 different children. Mm -hmm. And the woman has to literally sit there and clean the house and cook. Mm -hmm. And they are taught to like be okay with this. Yeah. And then they're taught to teach their daughters to be okay with this. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I do. It's it's terrible. I, I always hated it. And I and I gotta be honest, I hated it because I saw it like in my grandfather. Mm. My grandfather was the guy, like, you know, God rest his soul. Um, I've I've dealt with the anger of all of this already. But I now speaking honestly, my grandfather was the guy that would go out to the salsa clubs. He would dance salsa and it, and it, and his two, you know, oldest sons would basically back him while he would grab the girl and go like be with the girl behind my grandmother's back. And he was celebrated for this. Wow. He was the man for this. Right? right. And I'd be sitting there thinking like, what the hell? Does, does everybody not know that I have seven grandmothers and there's... <laughs> Right. 14 or 15 different <laughs> aunts and uncles from the, and does, does, does everybody not catch on to this? Right. We all loved each other, but still it was like, I don't know that he was ever held accountable for that. I'm going to say he most likely was not. Was not. <laughs> yeah. Because the culture gave him a free pass and celebrated it. Yeah. So, so part of what you're saying, if there are women listening and they're feeling like, wow, you're right. This is resonating with me. I think that there's two good places to start. One is we need to identify where we're feeling not taken care of in our own lives, right? So how do we do this? We're going to do a quick resentment inventory. So you're going to think right now, if you're listening, if you're watching, what are you holding resentment? Like where and for whom and why? Because usually when we do these resentment inventories, it'll show you either where a boundary is being crossed, you need to establish a boundary, but somewhere a need of yours is not getting met. If you're feeling, it, it could be a lot of resentment. It could also be sort of just that low resentment. Like it comes off as sort of irritability, where like this person is irritating. But why? That's not a state you need to live in. So that's the beginning. Once you identify, so maybe you're like, wow, that's interesting. Most of my resentment is towards like my sister, my boss, and someone else. Then you have to look at that and go, all right, what is the scenario? What is my 50% of this interaction? Where am I not talking true, as I would say, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. What what am I letting slide but that I'm, I'm really upset about or I'm pissed off about? Because we have to take responsibility, right? Every relationship you're in, every relationship I'm in, every relationship anyone's in, you're 50%, the other person is 50%. That's 
That's literally, mathematically, all it can be. Mm -hmm. So first we look at our 50%. And then we go, okay, I see what's happening. This person keeps being late to meet me. I keep not saying anything. I think I need to give them the heads up. And you can say something very simple, very neutral, with a smile on your face. Hey, I'd like to make a simple request. If you're going to be late, that you just text me. Because if I knew you were going to be late, I would have walked the 20 blocks instead of taking an Uber. Right. We would have gotten here at the same time, and I could have gotten more steps in. So just let me know next time. Right. So we make that. That's like for a first timer. So you make that request. For some people, that will be enough. They'll go, oh, the next time they'll remember, and they'll text you, and then you'll walk, and you won't take an Uber, and everything works out. Even right. though they're still going to be late, that's fine. They're being considerate. Then you'll have people who you make the simple request, and they leave you sitting again. You took an Uber. They were 20 minutes late. Again, so that's a repeat offender. And then we have to do something else. There has to be at some point, if someone keeps crossing the same boundary, we have to attach a consequence to that action. And I was always that person who was on time or early to things. And I always, of course, had people who were late. And I would, when I was less healthy, I would literally just leave the restaurant. If my sister was three minutes late, I would literally be like, uh, tell that bitch I left. Like, yeah. literally, I would just be out the door. Like, that, that's I have, a little I have extreme. a story about that, yeah. <laughs> that's a little extreme, yeah. right? Yeah. But you can say to someone, hey, if you don't let me know, then I'm not going to meet you out. You can come to my apartment. We can order in. But I don't want to be left sitting in public for 20 minutes. It really bums me out. It makes me feel unimportant to you. And I don't think that's how you mean it. But that's what's happening. And I feel like it's bad for the relationship because I'm feeling resentful. So we can do it with, with easy language. So that, that's the first. Terry, you know what I love? I, I love how often we as human beings are afraid to speak our truth because we've been conditioned to not speak our truth. And then when we finally speak our truth, we come off so aggressively <laughs> and so angry. It's because it's, it's been all of this pent up emotion and energy that we have inside of us ourselves that when we finally speak it out, it's like the opposite of what we want happens. And we end up attracting the very situation that we don't want to happen when we speak our truth. And what I love about this is that when we're in our authentic truth, we can communicate that truth in a very nice way, yes. in a very non-offensive way, and in a very almost non-confrontational way. And it's like, the energy in which you carry yourself while you share that is just very like, listen, like this is just who I am. Mm -hmm. And if you love me, like you're gonna understand that. And if you don't, that's okay as well. Right. I just won't meet you. That's right. In a public place because that's my right. That's right. To not put myself in a situation where I'm going to be pissed off the entire meal, giving you one word answers and not wanting to be with you because I'm mad. Right. So I think that this is one of the myths about boundaries, and I'm glad that you pointed it out, Danny, because people think having boundaries means being aggressive, saying no, blocking people, ah, punching people in the face verbally, and it doesn't at all. Because what I teach you to do, and what I teach you in the book, Boundary Boss, is to set boundaries early and often. Because if we do it early and often, we're not the volcano. Why are we the volcano that you described? Because we waited too long. We let it happen 15 times. By number 16, we're ready to throw up ashtray at someone's head. Like, so, so part of it is we're not accumulating resentment because you will lose control yeah. of yourself if you wait too long. You know, we, we think it's going to be cool, but you wait too long and you're saying mean things. You're, you're turning it into something else. And this is how boundaries get a bad rap, but they don't deserve it. You know? Yeah. I love that. It's, it's almost like, it's also, there's, there's parts of us that you know, for example, what if there's something that we like and the other person doesn't like that same thing that we like and because there's an insecurity within ourselves or maybe some uh, distorted attachment <laughs> issue, then we all of a sudden forget about that thing that we like and then like 10 years later, you're no longer you. Yeah, absolutely. You're literally a different human being that keeps backing down from the very things that made you you, right? Maybe you like going for a walk every morning, but the person you're with doesn't like it when you leave. Maybe you like working out every day, but the person that, you, that you're with would rather eat pizza and sit on the couch. Right. You know what I mean? Maybe maybe you like hanging out with your friends and going to play golf, but the, the person that you like or, or with, the, you know, doesn't like that. And, right. And it's not even that they don't like that. It's like, I get this all the time. There's this, this joke amongst men and women with golf. Mm -hmm. Right. It's not that she doesn't like you to play golf. It's just that you've been working 
for five or six days. Mm -hmm. And then finally, on the day that you have off, she wants you to spend time with her. That is a natural yep. desire in a very healthy relationship. Yep. So how could you, as a man in this case, communicate or, by understanding her position mm -hmm. that all she really wants is you and, and if she wants you and you don't know how to reciprocate that mm -hmm. want, what is it saying about your current state of affairs? What is it saying uh -huh. about the place of your heart? What is it saying about your love for that individual? Because truly, you should want her as well. Yeah. And the thing with boundaries is that having disordered internal boundaries is what you're describing when we sort of become a chameleon and morph ourselves into, we're like wrapping ourselves around the reality of the other person. They're like, no. Walking is not good. Pizza. Pizza's good. Then you're like, okay, I guess pizza, pizza's good. I guess that's what we're doing. But you're right. People wake up 10, 20, 30 years down the road and they're like, who the hell am I? And how did I get here? This is having disordered internal boundaries. And the same thing, if you have a, a partner who you love and they work all the time and on their first day off, they are not prioritizing you. What are you saying about it? Right? Are you just complaining? Or are you saying, hey, this could actually be a deal breaker for us because I'm alone during the week. If you don't miss me in the same way that I miss you, we need to really, we really need to dis make decisions. We need to compromise, maybe do nine holes, and then we go out and do something together. But let's talk about that because we're, we're each responsible for getting our own needs met in relationships. And I think there's a lot of silent suffering or passive aggressive expression of anger or withholding sex. Like there's lots of different things that will happen that, trust me, that person, whether it's a woman or a man who is feeling neglected and unimportant because that other person wants to golf instead of be with them. Oh, they're going to show mm -hmm. that feeling because feelings that we don't like because they're inconvenient, anger, resentment, they don't go away simply because they're inconvenient. Like you either learn how to communicate them directly or you're going to communicate them indirectly. Yeah. In your energy. In your energy, in your behavior, in your eye roll, in your heavy sigh, and you're slamming the door. There's all kinds of ways that, that you're going to let that person know about your displeasure. But it's so much more loving to tell the truth. Hey, it kind of hurts my feelings. Yeah. Because I haven't seen you all week and I'm really looking forward to seeing you. And to think that you'd rather go play golf with your friends makes me think we really need to either get into therapy or talk about it or like, are we drifting apart? Like have a real conversation. And you know what? And then, you know, as a man that, you know, I remember being that guy and I remember, you know, if, if I'm honest, golf was like an escape for me yeah, yeah. because my relationship was so bad. <laughs> right. If I'm honest. Yeah. You know, now that was me. You know, if you truly are a man that like truly loves golf and you're into it, I can also see how it's so much fun. Yep. It's so wonderful. Like be out there with the guys and be in nature. And, yeah. you know, if you can do it the right way, it's like you get out there like at seven in the morning, you're yep. done by 11 and then you can spend the rest of the afternoon with, Absolutely. with your partner. Absolutely. Or know? plan a beautiful evening together. There you go. And your yeah. your partner probably won't care. She'll go to the gym. She'll do her own thing. Right. It's all about, are you thinking? about me? Am I thinking about you? Are we thinking about each other in a similar fashion? Yeah. Because it can't just be one person being like, I'm going to, I'm going to love you and me enough for everybody. Like it can't be that there's got to be that mutuality, yeah. you know? Yeah. So, so tell me this, you work primary, you work only with women? Not really. I mean, listen, my courses, men and women, a lot of them can take, but my, my audience is predominantly women. Women, I would say, probably 90%. Women. So if you were to break down the different categories in which you see women have a difficult time mm -hmm. setting boundaries, what would they be? So many. I would say relationship with family. Relationship with family. Yeah. Okay. Relationship with friends. With friends. <laughs> Romantic relationships. Okay. Sometimes work relationships. Okay. Where the really successful people in my practice, which is, that, that's really what I draw as very capable women. Mm -hmm. They're getting it all done, like all of it, but at the expense of themselves. Yeah. So they are the high functioning codependents is what I call it, where, you know, people look at them and they're like, she has got it together. 
but they don't know that she's exhausted and internally suffering and what's happening. I think relationships, like personal relationships, tend to be the hardest ones for women, mm -hmm. where especially family of origin, because think about, if you think about our, the way we relate to boundaries in our relationships, they're like, we're like doing dances, right? You do this, I do that. It's like a dance, we're moving. Now, think about who's the original dance troupe? Your family of origin. That's right. So why is it when you go home, like you could get into like the weirdest fight with like one of your siblings that you would never get into with one of your friends. You're like, am I 12? Like, how did this just happen? I almost had a fist fight with my brother or whatever, you know, yeah, yeah. where people would come back. But I feel like family has a tendency to bring us back to the way that it was, even though we've transformed quite a bit. Yeah. So with women, what I say is that you, again, once you do the resentment inventory, you have to then look at where are you giving an insta yes? Where are you automatically complying with things in life and in the world? Because again, this falls under the category saying yes when you really want to say no mm -hmm. under the umbrella of being nice. Mm -hmm. Now, we all were raised, be a good girl, turn that frown around. If you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Like, I could keep going. I won't. But you know that we were indoctrinated into a culture of you should make sure that everyone else is comfortable and that you are not making them uncomfortable. Don't be rude. Be polite. Send a thank you note. All the things that we learned that can make adult life creating boundaries very difficult. For sure. Because how many times have you heard the women in your life say, I, don't, I just don't want them to think that I'm being mean or... Can I tell you something? Sure. Let's do it. You just met Jen. Mm -hmm. She is literally the first woman in my life that I have ever met that doesn't give a shit what you think or what... And I love it about her. Do you know why? Because it is... It feels so refreshing. Yes. It feels so healthy. It, it feels... Honestly, you know, I, I know I talk about this a lot, but... You know, the, the feminine thrives in safety. Yes. But I got to tell you, like, there's parts of me that feels really safe being around her. Like, I can literally be myself. Yes. You know what I mean? And I'm, and I'm talking in the subtle ways that men have challenges. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, sometimes I'm lean, mean, fit, and I'm just like feeling powerful. And sometimes I went three days of eating shit, right? <laughs> right. And I got a little pudgy belly or whatever. And I'm, I'm, I'm safe to be around her and be myself in any aspect because I know she's safe to be around herself. Right. Like there's li literally zero parts of her. It doesn't exist in her where she is concerned with what you think about her. And that feels so powerful. It is so powerful. Yeah. And it's rare. It really is. It, it really is. Because here's the thing with boundaries. When you're someone who says yes when you want to say no, you are actually emotionally untrustworthy. And what you just described is that Jen is emotionally trustworthy because she will tell you the truth about what she thinks, how she feels, what she wants. You're not guessing. You're not like, I, I think she's happy. I can't tell. You know, it's funny. I'm, I'm going to tell you this little story real fast. But this just happened last night, right? I, I you know, every morning, I mean, or every, when I'm, when we're sleeping, I get up and I get out of bed and I go use the restroom or whatever. And I guess I'm walking around without knowing it, like, <laughs> you know, like, like an elephant. You know, yeah, like an elephant, right? And she goes, babe, my mom even asked me, I bet Danny got up at around two and a four o'clock. <laughs> and, 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 and then I go, uh, and then I go, no, I'll stop. I don't do that. And I go, she goes, I'm telling you, you do this, right? <laughs> and so the next thing you know, I don't know what happened, but I was, I was like, you know, um, okay, I'm going to wake up tomorrow at, you know, 5.30. I'm going to go for a walk at 6. She literally said, okay, we're not going to do this. And I, I thought she meant, you're not going to go for a walk. She's <laughs> like, we're not going to do this anymore because I cannot do this for the rest of my life. So every morning when you wake up to go for your walk, you're like a stomping elephant everywhere. And I'm, I'm giggling inside for two reasons. Number one, because she's probably right. But number two, because there was no shit given. She just told me exactly <laughs> how it is. And I love it about her because you know what? I come from relationships in my past where I didn't feel safe yeah. enough in myself to speak the truth. Okay. So it's like by her speaking very direct truth, it gives me the freedom to do the same thing. Yes. And now we like, there's no secrets. There's no thing unsaid. It's like, we're just, and we get closer that way. 
it's how a healthy relate what you're describing is how a healthy relationship can thrive to like these incredible heights because we're not playing out unresolved childhood wounds with each other, which takes bandwidth, time, energy, misunderstanding, hurt, feelings, all of this crap. If you haven't done that work, and some people are naturally, like I don't right. know with Jen, is it that she's had a shit ton of therapy or that she's sort of naturally this way, you know, but either way, you're not distracted by all of these distraction fires that don't have to do with you. It's like, oh, well, I didn't like your tone and I think you meant this. And you're like, yeah, what? I don't I, have it. No, I, don't have time I didn't. For any of that? I don't have time for any of that. But that's yeah. most people's relationships. Yeah, for years. Yeah, and healthy boundaries and effective communication are really the thing that we want to have thriving, beautiful relationships. And you have to be able to harness that within yourself first, of course. Yeah, because because what I have found in life, like the more and more spiritual work that I do, the more and more that I realize like we're the ones creating it all. Yes. Not only are we creating it all, but our partners are just a mirror for what's inside of us. Yeah. You know, for what we're ready to allow to come out, right? Or the parts of us that are afraid and that are hiding. Yes. Quite frankly. It's you know? so true. I mean, you look at Harville Hendricks' work and he talks about how we'll draw someone. Hopefully if you draw a good mate, They'll mirror the parts of you that need your attention, but you'll be able to fix it. Yeah, together. Safely, right, right, exactly. Together, like right. it creates a container where you can deal with those childhood wounds. But a lot of times people attract people who are not, they're not able to help in that. And it's just repeating the childhood wounds, right? right? Which we'd like to avoid. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I love that. And so I, I, I can't end the episode without asking you. When I asked you what are the the top places and where women have the hardest time setting boundaries, you right away went family. Mm -hmm. Can you give me an example of maybe some women that you've worked with or maybe your own story where there was an issue with like a family member that it was constantly coming up, constant arguments, constant disconnect, and one simple something helped heal it or helped fix it. Or if not, how would a woman, or for that matter, how would a human being that's listening right now mm -hmm. be able to like help fix these unhealthy family relationships that we have? Well, you have to identify where a boundary is needed, right? You have to identify what is causing you pain in the relationship. Let's just say with the mother. The mother stops by your house without asking. She lives close. She's constantly barging in. She has a key, right? You don't like that. You would like a heads up. You, cause I actually had this with a client. So she, her parents moved close to her and they just couldn't get with letting her know that they were on their way over. They would just come at any point. And she talked to them. We set up boundaries. They kept breaking the boundary and being like, oh, come on, don't be ridiculous. It's family. It's just us. And she was so hurt and offended by the fact that they were not respecting her as an adult. She had her own family. She had kids. She's like, I'm not 15. You could be walking around naked. Well, you could be having exactly. sex. You that, could be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Correct. Right. So anyway, she we decided that the only alternative was to change the lock. And she did. Good for her. And it brought up the conversation that needed to happen. And her parents had, she had a good relationship with them. And they had broken the boundary enough times that they weren't like wholly shocked by the change in lock. But what that brought up was a conversation where they were like, okay, now we understand you spent $500 to change the locks on your house, that you're serious, we're sorry, and we're going to do it. And they were able to, but it takes a long time, especially in well-established relationships, sometimes for people to get it. But her parents cared enough about the relationship. That's the key. To let go of the idea of their daughter as a 15-year-old when she was a 45-year-old and decided it doesn't matter how we feel, respecting her boundaries is important enough to her that we're now going to do it. And it's amazing how when you start articulating your boundaries, you might be shocked at how many people are like, thank you for telling me that. Mm -hmm. I didn't know you felt that way. Well, it was like me stomping around like an elephant. <laughs> I had no idea. So this morning I'm like tiptoeing <laughs> like around and she's like, babe, I didn't hear you this morning. And how loved she will feel every time she does not hear you stomping around like, like an elephant. elephant. That's right. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Final thoughts. Final thoughts for the the women who are listening and, you know, they, they want to be able to have healthy relationships. They want to feel in their power and they want to speak their truth. You can change the way that you relate to your boundaries. You can talk true. You can speak authentically. But the most important takeaway is that 
how you think, what you want, how you feel. That matters and it has to matter to you more than it matters to anyone else. You have to think that that matters the most and everything else can fall into place from there. And when you do, isn't it incredible how the right people (laughs) stick around and the wrong people simply fall away? Yes, because now you, you are resonating on a different vibe. When you tell the universe what I think matters, I will attract people who agree with that self-assessment. That's right. Beautiful. I love it. How do people get a hold of you or find you or discover you? You can find me at terrycole.com. I'm also just Terry Cole at um on Instagram. Okay. And uh, Terry is one R? One? No, two R's. T-E-R-R-I-C-O-L-E. Uh-huh. Beautiful. I love it. Thank you so much. This was wonderful. It really was. Thanks yeah. for having me. Yeah, for sure. That's this week's episode of The Higher Self. It felt like it went fast, but it felt like it was meaty, like there was a lot going on there. And so I think if you were listening, this is definitely one that you have to listen to again. And uh, we look forward to having you next week on another episode of The Higher Self.